Chapter 10. Harry Hooper. For years, Harry Hooper has been considered one of the greatest outfielders that ever lived. He is also one of the most dangerous hitters in a pinch, pinch that the game has ever known. If I were an American League manager, I don't know where I would, where I could find a better outfielder than Trish Speaker, or Ty Cobb, and Harry Hooper. John J. McGraw, my 30 years in baseball. Sure, I, I still don't... I still follow baseball. Of course I do. What a question to ask. Those darn giants. Sometimes I can't sleep for or worrying over them. It didn't used to be so bad, but now that they're only about 75 miles away, and I hear all the games, the situation has gotten impossible. That Willie Mays, he's one of the greatest center fielders who ever lived. You could go back to as far as you want and name all the great ones. Tris Beaker, Eddie Rausch, Max Carey, Earl Combs, Joe DiMaggio. I don't care who you name. Mays is just as good, maybe better. He's a throwback to the old days. A guy who can do everything and plays like he loves it. And that Koufax, and you name a better left-handed er in the history of baseball, and I'll eat my hat. I started playing my first professional baseball all right here in Calif- the California State League in 1907. Actually, I n- never had any intention of taking up baseball as a career. I expected to be an engineer, went to St. Mary's College, and got my degree in civil engineering in 1907. After graduating, I played with the Sacramento Club mainly because they promised to get me a surveying job. They did, which I wasn't playing ball. I worked as a surveyor for the Western Pacific Railroad. Got $85 a month for playing ball and $75 a month as a surveyor. I guess you might say that was my bonus, a surveying job. Actually, my bonus was $12.50. Before I graduated, I played a few games in that that same league. The California State League, the Alameda, with Alameda, excuse me, uh, that was right near school. This fellow who owed, owned the Alameda Club, Mr. McMenamin, asked me if I'd play on the team the last few months of my senior year, and I agreed and with the understanding that he'd give me my release as soon as I got a, out of college. Well, just about the time college was letting out, we played a game at Sacramento, and I did pretty well. Charlie Graham was managing Sacramento oh, at the time, and he went to Mr. McMiniman and wanted to buy me, not knowing, of course, that I was due to get my release any day. Mr. McMiniman came to me and said, Look, I've got a chance to, tell, to sell you to Sacramento. If you don't say anything about this agreement, we have to release you, or I'll give you half of whatever we can get. Okay, I said, Better you, you better warn them that I'm going to stop playing as soon as I get the right of an engineering job. I'll probably quit at the end of the summer. All right, he said, but I'll do that. You, don't you mention anything about your release. After Charlie Graham told me how the conversation went, first all of all, the Alameda owner did tell me about my a being an engineer. Okay, Charlie said, I don't understand that. I think we can get him an engineering job. We can work at and play ball both. Or he can work at and play ball both. Uh, How much do you want for him? Oh, about $200. How about $10? Charlie countered. Make it $50. I'll make it $20. And they settled on $25. I was sold for 25 lousy dollars. Talk about deflating a guy's ego. So my bonus was half of the sales price, namely $12.50. Later, Charlie told me he smelt a rat the minute the guy asked to, for $200, and he should have asked for $500. So I went as slow as I could, he said, just to test the situation out a little more, and it, it worked. Had two pretty good years to Sacramento, serving all the while when one day near the end of the 1908 season, Charlie Graham came to me in the hotel lobby. Well, he said, how would you like to take a look at the big Indian? Huh? 
I didn't know what he was talking about. Big big Indian, Boston. How would you like to play with the Boston Red Sox? He he says, John I. Taylor, the owner of the Red Sox, is coming to town next week, and I think he's interested in you. Well, I don't. Well, I don't know. I said, I'm not a ball player. I'm an engineer. I'm doing really well at the Western Pacific Railroad, and I like my job. You see, he figured I was a ball player who did this other stuff. Quote, unquote, quote, Marte, Asian marks on the side. But I figured I was an engineer who played ball on the side the other way around. Why not give it a whirl, he said. Why have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? You're only 21. And even if you play ball all another two years, you could still take up this other stuff at the age of 23. Well, it would be a nice trip to Boston and all. Get to see how much of the country, see some of the country, I thought. Okay, I'll do it. I'll talk to the guy. How much salary do you think I ought to ask for? How much do you think you should get? I have no idea, I said. Would 2500 be right? I think it would, Charlie said. But that means you should ask for 3000 in dollars, then maybe he'll give you the $2,500. The California State League C was an outlaw league, not an, or, or, an organized baseball. So the Red Sox couldn't just buy my contract. They had to negotiate with me as though I was a free agent. That didn't hold for the deal that where I was sold by Alameda for, to Sacramento because they respected each other's contracts with the league. As an outlaw, a league, they didn't steal players from each other, just from everybody else. So one warm August day in 1908, I met Mr. John I. Taylor, owner of the Boston Red Sox, at the corner of 8th and J Streets in Sacramento, California. We went to a bar and had a glass of beer. I hear you're an engineer, he says. Yes, I am, I said. Well, that's very interesting, he says. It so happens that we are thinking of building a new ballpark in the not-too-distant future, and we may be looking for someone just like you. Your experience with the Western Pacific will no doubt prove invaluable. By, by the way, I also hear you're a baseball player. Yes, I am, I said. I was just wondering, he said, given your qualifications in both lines of endeavor... Er, how would you like to migrate to Boston? I wouldn't mind, I said. Well, we'd like to have you. At that, he said. At that moment, however, we are not in immediate need of engineering assistance. So considering that for the time being, we could... We... We could... Uh, uh, um. I was wondering how much money you would want. About $300 or $3,000. I'll tell you, he said. The fact is, I was thinking of something in the neighborhood of $2,500. What do you say we compromise at $2,800, $2,800? Seems very equitable to me, I said. So I have finished out this season with Sacramento, said goodbye to Charlie Graham, and told him that from then he was on... He was my unofficial business advisor, resigned my job with the Western Pacific, and started on what I figured would be just a couple of years of playing baseball, just a couple of years. And then was that was the last job I ever had that was connecting with engineering. Fenway Park was built in Boston and Shy Park in Philadelphia, Yankee Stadium in New York, and all the while I was nowhere near a drafting board. I was out there in right field the whole time drawing a line on a baseball instead of a chart. And in case you're wondering, I have no regrets. I joined the Red Sox for spring training in 1909 at Hot Springs, Arkansas. After a week or so, I started to get a pretty good idea of my competition. Trish Speaker was there. He came up at the end of the previous season, and it looked like he had a strange hold on the center field job. Or stranglehold on the center field job. Then there were three other outfielders also, besides myself, and it looked to me like I belonged on that team. I thought I was a good or better than any of them, 
but everybody didn't seem to see things my way. Because after about three weeks, they decided who would be the regulars, and I wasn't among them. We get the Boston papers, and I read that this Hooper appears to be a good prospect, but he seemed, but he needs several years seasoning in the minors before he'll be ready. That made my blood boil. I knew I was good at enough to make that team. However, once they picked the regulars as youngsters, it didn't get much chance to show what we could do. We never really got a proper opportunity during all of spring training. The old timers kind of had that thing by the horns, you know. Wouldn't have had let us have batting practice. A few of us wound up wound up taking our bats into the outfield and having our own batting practice. Spring training training for what? Well, we opened up in Philadelphia on April twelfth, nineteen oh nine. Played three games in the brand new Scheib Park. I sat on the bench the whole series. I didn't even have a road uniform. I heard rumors that they were getting ready to ship me to the minors to St. Paul and the American Association. I was getting hot under the collar because I knew if they gave me a chance, I could do the job. From Philadelphia, we went to Washington. Climbed up to the top of the Washington Monument for the first the first morning there. I had to get some exercise, and then went out to the ballpark expecting to sit on the bench through another game. But I had hardly gotten into the clubhouse before the manager, Fred Blake, came comes over to me. Here's your uniform, he says. Uh, you're going to play today. Lucky combination of circumstances. One of the outfielders was hurt, and, was, and another had to go in and play first base because the first baseman was sick. They had to play me because they didn't have anybody else. Well, if we'd been ballyhooed as a wonder of, or something, I'd probably have been a little shaky. But the way it was, nobody expected anything of me, and I went out there and determined to show them. First time, it was my turn at bat, and we had a chance to score a run. Man, on second, two out on the bench, I could hear everyone saying, Who's up? Who's up? And then, oh, a super. Well, too bad. But I went up there and drove in that run. I got another hit that day, and it would have been, had a third if the pitcher hadn't stabbed a liner headed right for his forehead. One of those instinctive grabs, you know, and in the field I handled myself okay. In other words, everything went just fine. Before the day was over, John I. Taylor was going around shaking everyone's hands and that's the boy I signed up in California. And that's how I come I never that's how come I never went to St. Paul. I had a good start and a little bit of luck and I needed it. You have to have a little luck, you know. That year in the next we started to form the nucleus of what would become the great great Red Sox ball club. We won the American League pennant in 1912, 15, 16, and 18. And in between, we finished second twice from 1912 to 1918. We won four pennants and four World Series. Never did beat us in a World Series, never. We played four different National League clubs in four different World Series, and only one of them came close. That was the Giants in 1912. We beat them in four games to three. We beat Grover Cleveland Alexander and the Phillies four games to one in 1915. The Dodgers four games to one in 1916. And the Cubs four to two in 1918. The best team in all of baseball for close to a decade. Oh, and let's not forget the Boston Braves in 1914. Boston was pretty good at the baseball in the 1910s. Anyway, they really were two teams. The 1912 team and the 1915 one. The outfield was the same on both, Tris Speaker, Duffy Lewis, and myself. I think I'd most as easily the greatest defensive outfielder ever. Larry Gardner was at third base on both teams, and Bill Kerrigan and Forrest K. E. caught the whole time. But at first base, it was Fur Erstrick Stahl and then Doc Hoblitzel. At second, Steve Yerkes was eventually replaced by Jack Barry. And at short, it was first Heine Wagner and then Everett Scott. 
And, of course, the whole pitching staff turned over from Smokey Joe Wood, Hugh Bennett, Bennett, Charlie Hall, and Buck O'Brien in 1912. It became Ernie Shore, Dutch Leonard, Carl Mays, George Foster, Joe Bush, Sam Jones, and then Babe Ruth in 1915 or so. Babe Ruth joined us in the middle of 1914, a 19-year-old kid. He was a left-handed pitcher then, and a good one. He'd never been anywhere, didn't know anything about manners or how to behave among people. Just a big, overgrown green pea. You probably remember him with that big belly he got later on. But that wasn't there in 1914. George was six foot two, and weighed 198 pounds, all of it muscle. George Babe Ruth. Um, he had a slim waist, huge biceps, no self-discipline, and not much education. Not so very different from a lot of other 19-year-old ball would-be ball players, except for two things: one, he could eat more than anyone else, and two, he could hit a baseball further. Lord, he ate too much. He st- he he'd stop along the road when we were traveling and order half a dozen hot dogs and as many bottles of soda pop, stuffed them in one after the other, gave a a few big belches, and then roar, Okay, boys, let's go. That would be babe for a couple hours, and then he'd be at it again. (laughs) 19-year-old youngster, mind you. He wasn't such a rube, and he got more than a share of teasing, some of it if it's not too pleasant. The big baboon, some of them used to call him, behind his back. And then he, a, get, a few got up enough nerve to ridicule him to his face. This started to get under his skin. And when they didn't let up his final, he challenged the whole ball club. Nobody was so dumb as to take up him up on it. So that put an end to that. You know, I saw it all happen from beginning to end. But sometimes... I still can't believe what I saw. This 19-year-old kid, crude, poorly educated, only lightly brushed by the social veneer we called civilization, gradually transformed into the idol of American youth and the symbol of baseball, the world over a man loved by people, and with an intensity of feeling in that perhaps has never been equaled before or since. Saw a man and transformed from a human being into something pretty close to a god. Somebody had predicted that because that back on the Boston Red Sox in 1914, he would have been a th- in a thrown into a lunatic asylum. I still remember when the babe was switched from pitching to becoming an outfielder. I finally convinced Ed Barrow to play him out there to get his bat in the lineup every day. That was in 1919. I was a team captain by then. Ed Barrow technically was the manager, but I ran the team on the field, and I finally... I finally talked Ed into converting Babe Ruth from a pitcher into an outfielder. Well, Babe Ruth might have been a natural as a pitcher and as a hitter, but he wasn't a born, sure wasn't a born outfielder. I was playing center field myself, so I put the babe in right. On the other side of me was a fellow named Brago Roth. Another wild name. Sakes alive, I'd be playing out there in the middle between the, those two fellows, and I began to fear for my life. Both of them were galloping around the outfield without regard for life or limb, hollering all the time, running like maniacs after every ball. A week if that was enough for me. I shifted the babe to center. I moved to right so I could keep clear of those two. Sheer self-preservation on my part, pure and simple. I'm still amazed that playing side by side, those two never plowed into each other with the impact of a two runaway freight trains if they had had the crash would have shaken the Boston Commons. Of all the the pennants in World Series we won, I guess 1912 was the most exciting. That was the first year the Lewis Speaker out, Hooper outfield 
Mayfield really became famous. That was the year Smokey Joe Wood won 16 straight games. The year Snodgrass muffled, muffed that fly ball in the last game of the series. Well, all in all, so many things happened that season that it's hard to find in another that can compare with it. I think the thing I remember best about 1912, though, it's the pitching of Smokey Joe Wood. Was he, he ever something? I seen a lot of great pitching in my lifetime but never anything to compare with him in 1912 1917 for instance i was in right field for the red sox when ernie shore pitched his perfect game against the washington senators i think it was i think it was 1922 i was in right field for the chicago white Sox, and then charlie robertson pitched his his perfect game against the detroit tigers I guess there haven't been more than half a dozen perfect games pitched in the history of baseball. I was right, the right fielder in two of them on two different teams, too. So you might say I've seen some pretty good pitching, but I've never seen anything like Smokey Joe Wood in 1912. He won 34 games that year, 10 of them shutouts, and 16 of those wins were in a row. It so happened that that was the same year Walter Johnson also won 16 in a row. That's still the record in the American League, by the way. And the fact that both of those fellows were so unbeatable that year gave rise to one of the greatest games in the history of baseball. You see, Walter Johnson set his first, his record first. Walter finally lost the game in August, ending his streak at 16. But Walter hardly had time to accept congratulations. Before, um, up loomed Joe Wood, who looked as though he'd take the record right away from Walter before the season had even come to an end. That Walter's streak ended at 16 in August. Joe had won 9 or 10 straight in a row. But then Joe kept adding to it. 11 straight, 12 straight, 13 straight. Early September, we were scheduled to play Washington. And the public started to clamor for Walter Johnson himself to be allowed to pitch for Washington when Joe Wood went for us. Well, Walter defend his record. That was the cry. Well, the owners were, were no fools. So when the Senators came to Boston for the series, it was arranged that Walter Johnson and Joe Wood would oppose each other in one of the games. The crowd was jammed. Fenway Park that day poured out into the field, and the team benches were moved out along the foul line so the fans would be packed in behind them. People were also standing all around on the outfield grass, held back by ropes. And by then, and Joe had won 13 straight, and Walter really was defending his new record. To make a long story short, Joe beat Walter Johnson that day, and the score was exactly you'd expect. One and nothing in the sixth inning. And uh, Tris Speaker hit one into the crowd, standing in left field for a ground rule double. He scored on a double by Duffy Lewis, and that was the whole story. Not another runner crossed home plate that all day. That was probably the most exciting game I ever played in or saw. After that, Joe won two more games to tie Johnson's record at 16. Then he lost the next time out on an error that led a couple of unearned runs score in the 8th or ninth inning. So now they both hold the record. The funny thing, that's also the same year Rube Marquard won 19th straight in the National League. Uh, Rube Marquard of the Giants. You might remember that chapter. On tension, on Joe was just terrific all that season. First, then 16 straight, then the World Series. I still remember talking to him before one of the games started and suddenly realizing that he couldn't speak. Well, 
er, couldn't say a word. The strain had started to get too much for him. Well, what can he expect? I think he was only about 22 when all this happened. Mighty young to be under such pressure for so many months. But he still won three games in that 1912 World Series. Last inning of the uh, last game of that series was quite a doozy. That's one they'll never forget. Giants took a 2-1 lead in the top of the 10th. First man up for us, bottom of the 10th, was Clyde Engel, pinch hitting for Joe. He hit a fly ball that Fred Snodgrass dropped. The famous Snodgrass muff could happen to anybody. I was up next, and I tried to bunt, but I fouled it off. On the next pitch, I hit a line drive into left center. It looked like a sure triple. 99 times out of 100, no outfielder could possibly have come close to that ball. But in some way, I don't know how. Snodgrass ran like a like the wind. Dang, if he didn't catch it, I think he outran the, the ball. Robbed me out of a sure triple. I saw Snodgrass a couple years ago at a function in Los Angeles. Remember, reminded him of that catch. Well, thank you, he said. Nobody ever mentioned that catch to me. All they talk about is a muff. I don't know about anybody else, but I remember that catch all right. I'm the one guy who will never forget it. After that, Steve Yerkes got a bit got walked, and that brought up Trish Speaker. Still behind 2-1. Well, there's one out. Well, Spokes hit a little pop. Spoke hit a little pop-up foul near first base, and old Chief Myers took off after after it. Didn't have a chance, but Maddie kept calling for him to take it. If he'd call for Merkel, it would have been an easy out, or Maddie would have taken it himself. Kept hollering for that for the chief to take a, and poor chief never saw or never was too fast to begin with. Lumbered and down the the line after it, it as fast as he could, as his big legs could carry him. Stuck out his big catcher's mitt, missed it. Just missed it. Spoke when it went back to the batter's box and yelled to Matthewson, Well, you just called on for the wrong man. It's going to cost you this ball game. And on the next pitch, he hit a clean single that tied the game. A couple minutes later, Larry Gardner drove in Yerkes with the run, and that won it. After the, after the wonderful season, Joe would have never pitched successfully again. He hurt his arm and never was able to really throw that hummer. Or anymore, the way he did it in 1912, Joe kept trying to come back as a pitcher, but never could do it. He had a lot of guts, though, that he couldn't pitch anymore. So he turned himself into an outfielder, became a good one. He could always hit. He played with Cleveland in the 1920 World Series as an outfielder. I think he's the only man besides Babe Ruth who was in one World Series as a pitcher, and another as an outfielder. Harry Frazzi became the owner of the Red Sox in 1917. Before long, he sold off all the best players and ruined them. Sold them all to the Yankees. Ernie Shore, Duffy Lewis, Dutch Leonard, Carlos Mays, Babe Ruth, then Wally Shang and Herb Pennick and Joe Dugan and Sam Jones. I was disgusted. The Yankee dynasty of all the 20s was three quarters the Red Sox of a few years before. All old Harry Frazzy wanted was the money. He was short of cash, and he sold the whole team down to the river to keep his dirty nose above water. After a, a way to end a wonderful ball club, I got s- sick to my stomach after the whole business. After 1920, yeah, I held out for $15,000. Harry Frazzy did it have me a favor by did me a favor selling me to the Chicago White Sox. I was glad to get away from that graveyard. Chicago, oh, I was, oh, they gave me a blank three-year contract and told me to fill in the figure. Well, I thought, I'll be doing business with Mr. Comiskey for some years and I don't want to start off on the wrong foot. So, excuse me, filling in $15,000, which was what I'd been holding out, for the Red Sox, I put down thirteen thousand two hundred fifty bucks. Well, 
I had five darn good years at the White Sox. Best hitting years I ever had. Hit 328 one year, 327 another. But in 1926, I got a contract in the mail calling for $7,000. That's right, $7,000. Wrote to Comiskey that reminded him that uh, when I signed with the team in 1921, I'd been more than a reasonable and filling it in, in a blank contract. I said, I thought perhaps that should have that sort be taken into account now. Ha! He wrote back that he never heard of anyone getting a guarantee of anything in the business and sent me my release along with the letter. And they really needed that me that year. They, nobody had to, to play right field. They had nobody to play right field. Well, that was early in 1926. I was 38, so I was into the real estate business for a while. Coached baseball at Princeton a couple of years. During the Depression, I fill, I took a, a fill-in for an, a job here at Cap. Capital uh, as postmaster didn't leave it until 25 years later. Supposed to be a quote unquote temporary job. I enjoyed the couple of years I coached at Princeton very much. Still go back there every once in a while. Beautiful sport, Princeton speak or beautiful spot. Princeton speaking about that today. They they make such a big deal with all the coach the college men in baseball and how about how baseball today that has such a better class of people than it is the rowdies of the old days. But that's not true at all. With respect to college men, let me give you an idea of what it re- really is like. I joined the Red Sox in 1909. When I got there, Bill Kerrigan was the regular catcher. he gone to Holly Cross. At first base was Jake Stahl from the University of Illinois. Go on, I. And at third was Larry Gardner from the University of Vermont. In the outfield, I had gone to St. I had gone to St. Mary's, and so had Duffy Lewis. Pitching staff was Matty McCall of the University of Maine, another civil engineering graduate, Chris Maloney from Fordham, and Ray Collins from Vermont. That was just the Red Sox. In general, I'd say that back in my day, maybe as many as about one of the, every five or six big leaguers had maybe as many or six had to gone to college. I don't know how many of them graduated, but that isn't the point. Point is, they came from colleges into professional baseball. Of course, it's ridiculous to think that only college men are gentlemen or are intelligent. That isn't worth it, or th- even discussing. But it should certainly be clear that the impression that we were in uneducated a bunch of rowdies is a lot of nonsense. Most people know that Matthewson went to Bucknell, but they don't realize that Frank Chance went to the univer- to Washington University, Hal Chase to Santa Clara, Buck Herzog to the University of Maryland, Orvi o- Overall to the University of California, Eddie Plank to Gettysburg Go- College, Chief Bender to Dickinson College, um, Art De- Evelyn to Georgetown, and so on. There were... S- and there were more. Ginger Beaumont went to Billiot College. Andy Coakley, Jack Berry to Holy Cross. Eddie Collins to Columbia. Eddie Grant to Harvard. Freddie Tenney to Brown. Bob Bachelor and Ed Rilbach to Notre Dame. Jack Coom- Combs to Colby. Harry Davis to Gerard College. Chief Myers to Dartmouth. Davy Jones to Dixon College. Etc. Etc. Many, many more. Why Miller Hugens and was Hugh Jennings... And Hugh Jennings were both lawyers. Hugan was a graduate of Cincinnati Law School, and Jennings went to Cornell. Both of them went to law school after they were in the major leagues. Even John McGraw went to St. in Bonaventure for a while. Also, after he was in the majors, do you realize that every one of those fellows those I've named was in the majors in 1910 or earlier? Most of them were there before 1905. If you take into account the proportion of the total population that went to college back in those days, I think it's pretty clear that we had more than our share of college men in baseball. And it's also pretty clear that the usual picture you get to old time ball player as a illiterate rowdy contains an awful lot of fiction that does is that.